Hi guys, it's Mr. Stevens here. We are back reading Son of the Morning Star by Evan S. Connell. We're going to jump right back in where we left off, uh, and I hope you guys are still enjoying it. Red Bear decided to pull out when it became apparent that the blue coats could not stop the Sioux, but he had not ridden very far when his horse stumbled and fell. It scrambled up and galloped toward the river while he chased it through the trees and wild rose bushes. Finally, a dead limb snagged the bridle. The limb broke off and dragged behind, which stopped the horse, but just then a Dakota Sioux came riding up. The bottom of the Dakota's face was painted red and the top was yellow. Red Bear shot him. The Dakota fell to the ground. By this time, Red Bear said, all he could hear was gunfire and the shrill eagle bone whistles of the Sioux. He ran to the little bighorn, saw his horse swimming around, and jumped in. He caught the mane of his horse, and together they reached the opposite side. But as he was climbing out, he saw the Dakota horse, a dark bay with a white streak on the forehead. It wore a necklace of deer hooves, and he heard the necklace clattering while the Dakota horse swam across the river. Then he saw bobtailed bulls, big pinto, which came plunging through the brush, snorting with fright. Quote, the tail and mane floating in the wind. The reins were flying, Red Bear said, and the rawhide saddle was bloody. Weeks later, this pinto showed up in the Arakara village near Fort Berthold, 300 miles from the Little Bighorn. The Arakaras composed a song about it. Red Bear saw Major Reno with a handkerchief tied around his head, quote, his mouth and beard white with foam, which dripped down and his eyes were wild and rolling. Quite a lot of testimony indicates that Reno did lose control and that a good many soldiers were scared witless. The Sioux ignored some of these terrified men, leaving them to be dragged off their horses and killed by boys. An 18-year-old Cheyenne named Wooden Leg said he and his friends jeered the blue coats, telling them that they should not even try to fight. They should get more crows and Shushones to help them. He and another Cheyenne rode beside one soldier who was so frightened that instead of killing him, they lashed him with pony whips. Reno was a West Point graduate with combat experience in the Civil War, so it is not likely that his eyes rolled desperately and that he foamed at the mouth, but he was excited. Of this, there is not much doubt. One officer present at the time said Reno ordered the men to mount and dismount three times in quick succession. As for the handkerchief, it was either red or white, and he had tried it around, tied it around his head because he had lost his straw hat. Under the circumstances, this insignificant detail might be considered remotely symbolic. Soldiers do not like to see their commandant lose his helmet. That he should wear a straw hat while charging into an enemy camp sounds eccentric, but Reno was not the only member of his battalion thus equipped. It was hot. Two months later, Gibbon's men would report 111 degrees in the shade, 116 degrees inside a tent, and a shrewd Yankee merchant on the Yellowstone turned a neat profit selling straw hats for 25 cents. There is no record of how many he sold, but it must have been a sight when Reno charged the village. Although correspondent John F. Finnerty was not at the Little Bighorn, he had met the Major and described him as a short, stout man, quote, with a determined visage, his face showing in intimate acquaintance with the sun and the wind. Arakara scouts, who knew him better than Finnerty ever did, compressed his nature and his appearance into a single phrase, man with a dark face. Just when the Arakaras began to call him, that is uncertain, possibly after he got into an argument with a scout named High Bear. Reno misunderstood a figure of speech, taking it as an insult and threatened to shoot High Bear, who responded by drawing a knife. Another scout, invoking Custer's name, jumped between them and managed to prevent a, bl a bloody settlement. From then on, if not earlier, the Rees had no trouble identifying that dark face. How well or how badly Major Reno directed his troops is still, after all this time, a subject of querulous dispute among Little Bighorn buffs. He himself felt so maligned and traduced by subsequent criticism that he demanded a court of inquiry, and by order of President Hayes, this court convened at Chicago's Palmer House on January 13, 1879. The investigation lasted almost a month, 
some 1,300 pages of testimony were recorded. Among the officers who testified was Reno's chief of scouts, Lieutenant Hare, who said that if they had continued their advance, the column would have been demolished in five minutes. Sergeant Culbertson testified, quote, If the skirmish had not been retired or had been held out for three minutes longer, I don't think any one would have gotten off the line. Lieutenant DeRudio saw no indication of cowardice. Quote, when he halted and dismounted, I said, good for you, because I saw that if we had gone 500 yards farther, we would have been butchered. Captain Moylan said, quote, in my judgment, if he had continued to charge down the valley, he would have been there yet. Nobody insisted the retreat was a triumph, Moylan went on, and as far for himself, he preferred life on the hilltop to death somewhere else. This observation moved the court recorder, Lieutenant Jesse Lee, to ask if the captain did not think it more honorable for a soldier to die fighting than to sit dishonored on a hill, a question Moylan resented. Reno testified that although he knew nothing of the local topography, it later developed that if they had charged another 300 yards, the entire command would have plunged into a ditch several feet deep and 10 yards wide. Indians were concealed in this ditch, and he thought most of his men would have been shot from the saddle even before they got to it. As for getting out, impossible. Lieutenant Varnum said the ground appeared to be open prairie. He did not see any ditch. Reno was asked about his relationship with Custer. He replied that he felt no animosity. He and the general got on well enough, but the implication of this was unmistakable. So he added that even if his own brothers had been riding with Custer, he could not have done any more than he did. His response did not satisfy Lieutenant Lee. Quote, the question is, did you go into that fight with feelings of confidence or distrust? Reno again responded that he and the general got along all right. Quote, my feelings towards General Custer were friendly. Quote, I insist that the question shall be answered, said Lee. Quote, well, sir, I had known General Custer a long time, Reno said, and I had no confidence in his ability as a soldier. Reno's counsel was a civilian named Lyman Gilbert, and after all the witnesses had been examined, he addressed the court on Reno's behalf. Speaking of the retreat, Gilbert asked rhetorically, quote, was he justified in doing so? Gilbert pointed out that the Indians, rather than confronting the battalion, as might be expected, began separating in an attempt to surround it, thus leaving their camp exposed to direct attack. This circumstance illustrated their strength. If they had been afraid, said Gilbert, undoubtedly they would have resisted any approach to the village. Quote, but when they gave way and invited an attack that, if successful, would have destroyed their homes, they declared to the commanding officer that they were not only able to protect themselves, but were able to destroy his command. And it must follow, therefore, that when Reno signaled a retreat, he acted wisely. During a recess in this trial, Captain Frederick Benteen was asked by a Chicago Times reporter why there seemed to be so much trouble with the Indians. Benteen answered that larceny by agents of the Indian Bureau was responsible. There had been, he said, quote, enormous pilfering and stealing. Agents whose annual salary was $1,500 were saving as much as $15,000 annually. Treat the Indians honestly and there should be no problem. Charles Campbell, who served in the 3rd Infantry and later as government agent in Oklahoma, had this to say, not at Reno's trial, but long afterward. Quote, the Indian agent has for years been the butt of the paragraphist and cartoonist, held up to public view as a grafter, if not a persistent robber. As a rule, they were a pay set of underpaid officials who had assumed the duties at the call of various religious denominations to which they belonged at much sacrifice of comfort and ease, not only to themselves, but as well to their families, to help bear the white man's burden. It is not possible to conceive that they would foment disorder or endanger the lives of those dear to them by acts that would foster rebellion. Campbell may have been correct about the situation in Oklahoma, but there was hanky-panky elsewhere. 
For example, it is known that a Baltimore contractor who supplied flour to the Sioux arranged with, a, with an agent to defraud the Indians by using three sacks from Baltimore to Cheyenne came the flour, at which point the inspector stamped each sack 100 pounds, whereupon 100 pounds of flour was distributed and three sacks retained as evidence that 300 pounds had been delivered. Things were different in Canada. Bishop Henry Whipple pointed out that on the northern side of the boundary lived the same greedy, dominant Anglo-Saxon race and the same heathen. Yet the Canadians escaped massacre and warfare. There was no single reason for this, but above all, the Canadian government kept its word. As Benteen implied, Canadian bureaucrats had sense enough to treat the natives honestly. And we will end there, uh, Son of the Morning Star, Custer and the Little Bighorn by Evan S. Connell. Uh, we'll end there for the day, and we'll get the, uh, the next part up shortly. I uh, hope you guys are still enjoying it, and I know I am, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye, guys.